Thank you very much. Uh, it was a great pleasure in my academic role to be a, a part, a central part of the gathering of the genetic information, the genotype data on UK Biobank. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is work that we've done in our spin-out company, Genomics PLC, around polygenic risk scores. Many of you will be familiar with the basic idea, but for those who aren't, we've learned from 10 or 15 years of studies of complex human diseases that for any common human disease, indeed for almost every human trait, uh, other than Mendelian traits, there are many hundreds or thousands or maybe even tens of thousands of genetic variants across the genome which affect an individual's risk of that disease. But individually, those variants have a small effect on risk. If you have an A rather than a T at this place on a chromosome, it might increase your risk by 2%, and a C rather than a G here increases risk by 3% and so on. And the idea has been around for at least 10 years of aggregating this information across the genome into what you might think of as a score and what has become called a polygenic risk score that measures for an individual the impact of these many thousands or tens of thousands or in some cases hundreds of thousands of genetic variants in terms of risk of a particular disease. And you can imagine if you did that across a large number of individuals in a population, most individuals would end up with scores in the middle of a range. They'd have some of these variants which bump their risk up a little bit, and some of the variants which bump their risk down a little bit. But there'll be some individuals who have been, for that disease, unlucky. They'll have rather more of the variants that increase their risk. And what has changed, and as Gil said, um, UK Biobank is central to this, what's changed in about the last 12 months is our ability to assess at scale in a cohort like UK Biobank, how useful this could be in terms of understanding risk for specific diseases. And I'll start by showing you a number of pictures uh, that follow from our work. Other groups uh, in the academic context have done very similar things. So this picture represents uh, polygenic risk scores for coronary disease, in this case in men of European ancestry in UK Biobank, about 150,000 men who contribute to the data underlying this picture. So what we did was to look at large uh, studies of coronary disease, not including individuals in UK Biobank. Within genomics, we actually have data on about 10,000 GWASs, and we leverage that multi-trade information to generate polygenic risk scores. So we calculate, uh, we determine the algorithm for the score, which SNPs will be involved, how much do you weight each of them. We do that outside UK Biobank, and then take it into UK Biobank, and ask for different sets of, in this case, uh, men, what happens if we partition them on the basis of their polygenic risk score? What happens in terms of their trajectory and the rate at which disease develops over time? And in the picture that's shown here, the red curve represents the individuals in the top 3% of polygenic risk scores for coronary disease. And it's using the health information in UK Biobank in a kind of Kaplan-Meier way to estimate incidence of disease at different age points. The blue curve are the middle 20%, and the green curve are those with the lowest risk in terms of polygenic risk score. I mean, there are a couple of things that, that uh, follow from this. The first is the red curve is much higher. So if you compare vertically, um, that speaks to relative risk. The relative risk of a man in this group is about four or five-fold, that of, of uh, the average. And actually, if you look horizontally, it says that a 45-year-old man in this group has about the same, or that group, had the same incidence of disease as a 55 or 60-year-old man who's typical and maybe a 65 or 70 year old man in another group. And I'll come back to that point uh, later. This is breast cancer. So as you're very aware, there are two genes uh, where mutations of a particular kind have a major impact on a woman's risk of breast cancer, BRCA1 and BRCA2. This is ignoring those. This is again just combining information from many hundreds or thousands of genetic variants. And you can do that outside UK Biobank, take it into UK Biobank, look at different groups of women based on their polygenic risk scores. And again, those with polygenic risk scores in the top 3% are at substantially elevated risk relative to the average. Their lifetime risk uh, in UK Biobank, which is probably a healthier cohort than average, uh, is almost 30%. And again, if you look horizontally, a 45-year-old woman in this group has about the same chance of having uh, breast cancer as a typical 55 or 60-year-old woman. And in the UK, we offer screening via mammograms to women at age 50. I think it's hard to look at this picture and think if the data were available, um, we wouldn't want to target screening at these individuals earlier uh, and maybe later for these individuals. So, so this information can help us target screening. Uh, also, uh, it changes the way we interpret screening. If you imagine a 60-year-old woman in this group has a positive mammogram and compare that to a 60-year-old woman in this group has a positive mammogram, because the baseline rate of disease is so different, 
the, different, the probability that it's a false positive is different uh, and much lower for this woman in the red group uh, than for the woman in the green group. So not only will it change the way, or can it change the way we target screening, but it can, can and should change the way we interpret screening. Similar picture for, for prostate cancer. Uh, this is Matt Hancock, who is currently, but uh, who knows for how long, Secretary of State for Health in the UK. Um, he spoke some months ago about his own polygenic risk scores. He was interested in this as a potential um, tool for the future in the NHS, and he wanted to understand from an individual point of view how that impacts an individual and their thinking, and he spoke about some of his results. One of them was prostate cancer, and this curve is the 3% of individuals, uh, as he explained, who have polygenic risk scores uh, like his, uh, and, and that resulted in him being predicted to be about 50% increased risk of prostate cancer. So we already have in the health system uh, ways of predicting disease. Uh, for coronary disease, there are a range of known risk factors, age, whether you're male or female, smoking history, family history, uh, cholesterol level, blood pressure, and so on. We use those routinely. In fact, GPs use them routinely in the UK via a tool called QRISC. And there's always been an interesting question of how do the uh, genetic risk scores, these polygenic risk scores, relate to the tools and the risk factors we already use to predict disease. So it's now possible, again, through UK Biobank, to actually work that out. It turns out that the polygenic risk score for coronary disease is almost independent of risk scores based on traditional risk factor. So formally, the correlation between the polygenic risk, our polygenic risk score for coronary disease and the Q risk score for an individual is 0.02. This shows that um, data explicitly. So this is saying, take the set of individuals with the highest score on Q risk, which is the tool used in the UK, and actually it's, it, it's, it's a very good uh, risk prediction tool for traditional risk factors. And then when you apply genetics, you separate even further. So amongst the set of individuals currently put in the high risk bucket, um, if you look at genetics, those with unhelpful genetics are actually at much higher risk than the average and those with helpful genetics. The same is true if you look at the next level of risk down and also if you look at the um, lowest risk individuals. So layering genetics on top of these traditional risk factors is informative. And in fact, the relative change, the relative risk in each of these groups is the same, uh, effectively because the risk scores are independent. Interestingly, and maybe surprisingly, uh, polygenic risk scores are largely independent of family history, uh, as used clinically. Uh, the correlation is 0.08 in this case. There are interesting questions about why that's true, uh, perhaps for another time because of time. So we've looked at, uh, at the possibility of combining polygenic risk scores with traditional risk factors, and this is a somewhat uh, busy slide that tries to give a sense of that. So if we can, if, if we do the calculations in the UK Biobank where we have the information and extrapolate to the UK population, and there are assumptions there because UK Biobank is not absolutely typical of the UK Biobank in many ways, uh, of the UK population in many ways, but nonetheless informative. So if you looked at the individuals in the UK aged between 40 and 55, you take the threshold that is currently used, is your risk of coronary disease over 10 years bigger than 10%? That triggers a recommendation uh, or at least a discussion about statins with your GP. So in that uh, group, there would be about a million people above that uh, risk threshold based on traditional risk factors. If you add in the genetics, two things happen. The first one, because the genetics uh, improves our ability to stratify risk, there will be more individuals above that threshold. From a million, it goes to 1.3 million. The second one is they will be different individuals. There are half a million people who uh, are above the threshold when you combine genetics with traditional risk factors who were not on the radar previously. Similarly, uh, there are individuals who were considered high risk just based on, on uh, traditional risk factors who are less high risk when you include genetics. Uh, the basic idea, these are effectively independent. If your risk is close to the threshold but below it based on traditional risk factors and you have unhelpful genetics, you can go up. And if you're above the threshold and you have helpful genetics, you can go down. So there are a couple of points here. Uh, uh, in the case of coronary disease, there's a natural intervention. In fact, current guidelines uh, recommend statins for individuals with this level of risk. So this would give us a better uh, tool to detect and, and offer that to individuals in question. Uh, and it sort of says that there are about half a million in this age group and extrapolating from UK Biobank, about half a million people who are kind of invisible to the system currently who meet that threshold were the right data and algorithms available. Genetics adds, uh, it adds uh, at different ages, but because age is such a key factor in, in coronary risk, the way these numbers would change if I looked at 55 to 70 year olds would be less, 
uh, but, but still significant. So one key point is we can identify people uh, who are at high risk that we're not currently identifying. The second one is that the traditional risk factors are very age-related, and partly because age is a key part of, of traditional risk, but also because things like cholesterol levels and blood pressure and so on tend to increase with age. What's interesting about the genetics is it effectively doesn't change through an individual's life, so we have the possibility of identifying individuals who will be high risk uh, early in their life, and thinking about doing the studies which would help us understand whether if we intervened early, in someone's 20s or 30s, say, with statins, uh, would that be helpful in uh, stopping the, the uh, development of coronary plaque, of atherosclerosis, uh, rather than waiting till it's relatively well developed and trying to stabilize it. That needs a proper study, but it's one, I think, that should be done. There are a whole lot of interesting questions uh, about how one takes this kind of information into a healthcare system in general and into the National Health Service. Uh, John talked about the um, early diagnosis cohort. Um, we're involved in that and, and we'll be doing the polygenic risk scores for those five million individuals. And, and so thinking about how to integrate that with the National Health Service is critical. Actually, in this, it's, it's always uh, naive, I think, to say that anything is easy in terms of implementation in a, in a large healthcare system. But in this case, one natural possibility is the GPs already have on their, on their desktop computers this QRIS tool into which uh, various pieces of information about the patient get entered. One can imagine a, a slightly enhanced version of that tool which also has a box for polygenic risk score, which can be entered if it's available and not if it's not. There'll be some other risk factors that will be missing for some patients anyway. The risk prediction tool can then do its thing using the genetic information if it's there, not using it if it's not. Um, and it comes out with, uh, with a number, which is the risk prediction, which the GP can interpret and feed back to the patient in exactly the way they do currently. So I'm cautiously optimistic that in that case, there's actually a route into uh, use in the National Health Service, um, which is potentially relatively low threshold and doesn't put additional pressure on already overstretched GPs. There are issues with polygenic risk scores. All of the data I've shown you uh, relates to individuals of European ancestry. These scores often do not perform as well in ancestries other than the ones where the original gen genetic studies were uh, conducted. There are aspects of our methods which we think are helpful there, but, but fundamentally, we in the community need much better data in those other ancestry groups. But just to give you a sense, the left-hand picture is the one I showed you previously uh, based on UK Biobank. The right-hand picture is the same, exactly the same polygenic risk score taken into individuals of non-European ancestry in UK Biobank. There are many fewer of those, so there's much more uncertainty about estimating um, cumulative incidence of disease, but nonetheless, uh, it's cautiously encouraging and more than one might have expected. Uh, that's the same picture for breast cancer, where uh, although the polygenic risk score is not uninformative in individuals of non in European ancestry, and these are relatively small sample sizes in UK Biobank, um, it, it doesn't perform nearly as well. So I'm optimistic, and I think the large cohort John's described will be a fantastic way of, of moving this forward. I'm optimistic that these approaches can make a huge difference in healthcare. I think in the case of coronary disease, it's pretty clear what that difference is. It's about identifying people who are at high risk that we don't currently know about. There'll be opportunities and challenges across many other diseases, but I think we can look on this as the start of a new era of what's been called predictive prevention in, in, in primary and in some cases in secondary care. Thank you very much.